join me in a warm welcome for Dr. P.K. Newby. When it comes right down to it, food is practically the whole story every time. When it comes right down to it, food practically is the whole story every time. What better way to open tonight's Science on Screen event focused on the future food than with one of my favorite quotes by Kurt Vonnegut. Truth be told, actually I open many of my talks and presentations and lectures with exactly that quote because it always pertains. Food practically is the whole story the whole time and we'll talk a little bit about that in my introduction to tonight's film. You can see from the slide here that I've titled my talk tonight, From Farm to Fork, What We Eat Matters. And what we'll do is reflect on the past, ponder the present, before we end my introduction by glimpsing on the future of food. Because, of course, we need to understand a little bit where we came from and where we are today to take a look and to think about what we might be eating in the many, many years, decades, and even hundreds of years from now into the future. I'm not going to spend any of our very, very precious time tonight talking about myself. You just heard about uh, that wonderful and generous introduction. Thank you very much for that. And if you want to find me, you can just Google me. You go to any of my links and you'll find out all about what I do. As you heard, I spend most of my time talking about why what we eat matters farm to fork. And I'm a nutrition scientist and food writer. So let's jump right in here. Where are we coming from? Where are we coming from? This graphic sort of nicely depicts what I'm going to go through in about a few million years of human history um, in the next few minutes or so. Essentially, once we came down from the trees, we, our earliest years were in, was in the Paleolithic era, the Stone Age, where we act as mainly as hunter-gatherers to obtain food and feed. So called the Stone Age, as you well know, because we developed stone tools, which enabled us not only to hunt food, but also to eat it more easily. If you fast, that was about 2.6 million years ago. Fast forward to our much, 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 much more recent history, more like a blip, about 8 to 12,000 years ago before present, we entered the Neolithic period. That was basically when the birth of agriculture began. That was in the Fertile Crescent of the Middle East. During that time, we first began domesticating animals as well as plants for human consumption. This is where we come back again to that wonderful statement by Kurt Vonnegut, because food is the whole story every time. Not only do we need it to live, to survive, but it is through that development of agriculture that we're able to develop the tools and technology, not only to better grow food, but to allow us to store it and of course eventually to trade it. This type of movement that happened that we're talking about right now during the Neolithic period forever changed our relationship between food, animals, and plants. Now, fast forward many, 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 many more uh, years from then. Now we're talking about essentially a blip on the screen of human history, what would be nanoseconds essentially if you thought about it. If you think about the past several hundred years, let's say the 18th and 19th century, we underwent additional revolutions in terms of changing our relationship with food. Through the industrial revolution, revolutions of the 18th and 19th centuries that occurred both in Europe as well as here, of course, that are currently going on in the developing world. After that, we occur, what happened here is we underwent the Green Revolution, which led to major, major increases in crops and our productivity with regards to agriculture. Through the efforts of Norman Borlaug and others, the, those efforts led to such major increases in crop yield that it is thought to have saved a billion lives due to prevention of hunger. That happened around the middle of the 20th century or so, and then of course after that we had the genetic revolution, now the digital revolution, which is continuing as we speak to change our relationship with food. A really nice graphic that talks about the 20 big inventions in food and drink was put together by the Royal Society in the UK a few years back. You can see refrigeration tops the list. Anyone who remembers, whether it's their parents, their grandparents, their great parents, that those days of yore when you had an icebox, that really wasn't that long ago, but we now are able to enjoy food in our own homes because of refrigeration. You can look to my blog or other places to go through this list, but each of these tools and technologies has changed our relationship with food, our ability to store it, our ability to enjoy it, and our ability to cook and feed each other with it. 
At the same time that we've enjoyed these wonderful, wonderful advances in our ability to grow food and to consume it, as we've just discussed, we've had alongside with it many changes in the health and demographic uh, issues that we face currently in the world. I will quickly recap them before getting on to the future of food. Essentially what we have is a global obesity epidemic. The pink is where there's 24 to 25% or more obese in the world. If you, if you include overweight in that category, it's about 1.2 billion people that suffer from what is essentially, of course, a preventable disease. Alongside its other diseases that are related to overweight, such as chronic diseases of coronary heart disease, type 2 diabetes, and so forth, these diseases are chronic diseases that are essentially modifiable through lifestyle factors, such as physical activity and, of course, diet. At the same time that we face our global obesity crisis, we still face hunger and malnutrition. Our projections for hunger were a little bit better than we expected this year, happily, but they still are hovering at about 828 million people. Of course, the majority of those are women and children. If you include those who are malnourished, meaning those who suffer from nutrient deficiencies, such as vitamin A, iodine, iron, zinc, which leads to early death, as well as nutritional blindness and other, other major, very serious problems, of course, that influence mo mainly children, that's an additional billion people. So we're talking about three, more than three billion of the world's populations are currently malnourished or have inadequate food nutrition in some way. At the same time, we waste about 30 to 50 percent of the food, depending on where you are in the world. Obviously, what I feel is not only a moral crisis, but also a crisis of many other problems when it regards to that food waste ends up in our landfills, at which further contributes to global warming. One billion of us lack safe and clean water, which of course is relevant for life as well, necessary for life. In addition to all of these human health problems, we have a whole host of environmental problems, which is why I spend my time saying, hey, nutrition, guess what? It's not just about you. Yes, it's great to think about how food impacts our own personal health. It also impacts our shared environment, our planet. The, the issues that I've listed up there on the screen are, of course, just a small example, just a few of the problems that we have in our environment today related to how food is grown. So, of course, that leads us to a question as to how we feed about 9 billion people in 2050. That is the question many, many, many people, scientists like myself, nonprofits, all kinds of all kinds of governments and groups are wondering how we're going to feed this massive population. The Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations estimates that we will need 70% more food, and guess what? Half of that needs to be grown in the developing world. So, Soylent Green. <laughs> Soylent Green. Well, if we read that description, the year is 20, 2022. The population of New York City has exploded to over 40 million residents, crammed into tiny apartments, and battling for food. While the wealthy hoard meat, fruit, and vegetables that have not survived on factory-made food produced by a corporate monolith whose latest product is the mysterious Soylent Green. Well, you know what? It really doesn't take a scientist or a genius to think that, you know what? That image and that description isn't that far off from where we are today. We can just replace our images of the, um, well, the, the prior image, in case you haven't seen the movie. I don't want to give anything away. Um, <laughs> in, you can replace those images with those of our... Um, CAFOs, which are known as concentrated animal feeding uh, operations, and we see our pigs, we see our uh, poultry, we see our cattle, we see uh, the factory workers putting the food together, and we can just simply sort of paraphrase and say the year is 2015 or even 22, not that much is going to change between now and then, and you can read the rest of what I've written there, and you can see that it really is pretty reflective as to what is going on really almost now. And this is not even to say anything of the many, many images you'll see in the movie that also reflect pretty massive environmental degradation. No, it's not a dystopia in this world yet. It doesn't exactly look like that, but it certainly is a, a movie that speaks to our current 
times for sure, which is why, why I proposed it to uh, the Coolidge here many months ago, and I'm so happy that they were interested in showing it and that all of you are here to see it. So let's move on a little bit, and I'll get to the present and the future of food before getting to our film. Well, so Soylent Green, perhaps we don't have that, but we do have Soylent. Perhaps you caught it in the news over the summer. It is now on the market. I don't know what the ingredients are, but I won't lie, it doesn't look very tasty to me, um, but it does purport to meet all your nutritional needs. I have, I won't digress, but I think that that is not clear whether it actually does or not, because I spent a lot of time thinking about food science and technology in my life, as you've heard. Nonetheless, we have a strong interest in, in meaning we, all of us here in the developed world, as well as increasingly around the world, for nutrition that is convenient for us, okay? And our need for taste as well. So let's go to a couple more things before moving to our movie. What are we eating now? Okay, before we talk about the future. Well, I'm not gonna go through this. You all know what you should be eating. Most people do. Why don't we? That's a different story. But in the meantime, although nutritionists sort of wish you were eating those things, what we're really eating is something that looks a little bit more like this. We have an incredible appetite for fat, sugar, salt, and guess what? Those corporate monoliths know all about it and they are creating those products that uh, make it very difficult for us to say no, for sure. In the meantime, we have a taste for convenience. We have a taste for meat. We have a taste that is the taste for meat that not only has been around now, but has been around for many, 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 many years. But the problem is that that taste and interest in meat is being exported around the world. Well, given that it takes about 13 pounds of grain to create a pound of meat, six pounds of grain to create a pound of pork, three pounds of grain to create a pound of poultry, you can simply think that, well, this is one of the major places where we're not only harming our health due to its relationship with heart disease and such other diseases, but due to that inefficient use of grain conversion, as well as the amazing costs of, of water and fuel and the methane production from beef, you can see how this is a major problem as it relates to the sustainability of food production in the present as well as in the future. So, I thought about this topic quite a lot when I was at Harvard. In fact, wrote this paper 15 years ago, went back to it. Many of the points I made still pertain. But my point here as it relates to the future is that, and the present, is that Taste, cost, and convenience are, are our major drivers of food consumptions in the developed world, and increasingly in the developing world, too, where we have the choices. You have to have enough first world problems, right? You have enough, have enough money to get food to be able to choose this. But here we know, following many, 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 many research studies, that it's been consistent for many years, that it is our drive for taste costs and convenience that really lead us to make food choices. Sure, health and convenience matter to some people, if you're able to think about it, but it still has to be filtered through that interest in taste, cost, and convenience. So where does this leave us? <laughs> yes, you're gonna have to go to the clip on YouTube. Um, I knew this audience would appreciate the, the little Star Trek references. Um, so T, Earl Grey, hot came from a food replicator, and is that what our future looks like? Well, let's talk about it for a minute. There's a lot of different aspects of food that will participate in our future without a doubt. One of them is I think that plants are going to be a major, major portion of our diet because we will be seeing a shift to less meat production as we have to deal with the very serious climate and other issues related to meat production. However, those plants may not come in the way you necessarily think about. They will come, sure, from a farm that you may be most familiar with from yesteryear, and of course, such farms still exist. Increasingly, they will also come from a laboratory, and of course, we know all about hydroponics and such that already exist today, but likely we will also see seeds that we see them now, but we will see them in the future, mainly using modifications like genetic engineering to create seeds that, let's say, are more drought resistant or that can deliver nutrition, those very vitamins that I was talking about, to people in the developing world who so desperately need them. Likely those will both be methods by which we create fruit and vegetables in the future, as well as in the present, I might add. What about McDonald's? Is McDonald's gonna be in the future? 
Who knows? I don't know if it's going to be McDonald's. It's been around a while now. But something of that ilk? Absolutely, because we have an interest in convenience in our lives, and that interest is only going to increase as we develop more time and interest in other activities in our lives. Whether they're in traveling to space or whatever they may be, we will always have an interest in convenience. Will that look like the traditional burger and fries? I don't know, maybe. We just talked about how the fact that I think that for sure, over time, we will end up reaching an asymptotic effect whereby we certainly will be decreasing our meat consumption. So I think that that burger might exist, but more likely it's made from insects. <laughs> If you follow the news, that insects have gotten a lot of attention lately in the news, and I'm very happy they have, because it is a very viable source of protein, that there's quite a lot of it around, and furthermore, it is used already in many places in the developing world. So we will absolutely see that as be part of our future. Will that replicator exist? Sure, as we know, it already does. We're already, we're already printing 3D pizzas. NASA has a grant for $125,000, and it's used this very technology to create foods like pizza to enable long trips to space, but that same technology can also be used to create food with less waste, that's more efficient, to get food to places like the developing world where it's so desperately needed, and also here, where we want it just for our own convenience. And likely, that 3D technology or whatever replication technology that will happen in the future, it will start to look less like pizza, in my opinion, and more like many of the beautiful and wonderful global cuisines from around the world, with those big spicy flavors and big bold spices used in places like Asia and beyond, as our world becomes smaller, and we here in the United States experience more of that. That also is changing as we speak. So in summary, I think that oftentimes when people think about our very serious food and health problems that we face as a society, they think as an either-or situation. They think here about local or global. They think about agroecology or conventional agriculture. They think about farm or a factory, a farmer's market or a supermarket. Organic versus GMOs, or genetic engineering. Comfort or novelty when it comes to creating dinner. Taste or health. Nature or science. I and many other scientists believe that these are false dichotomies. They are juxtapositions that really should not exist and really don't exist because the reality is that science and technology have been creating and impacting agriculture really from the very beginning of time since we first started developing stone, stone tools, right through refrigeration, to the microwave oven, to, the gen to genetic engineering. We have complex problems. We have a huge array of science and technology tools to help us solve them. I encourage you to think and be open to these various technologies in creating a healthy and sustainable future of food. Whatever you think, you can vote with your fork, you can vote with your vote, because buying and choosing and eating food does matter. I will end there on Vonnegut's, on Vonnegut's quote. Again, you can find me anywhere online. I will be signing books in the Brookline Booksmith right after the movie or a couple minutes after. I'll wait outside too to entertain any questions you may have. And whatever that future looks like, live long and prosper.